We are live. Uh, good evening, friends. Welcome to Indian Arthroscopy Society webinar today. Uh, it's a master series, and we are lucky that we have Dr. James Turner joining us from US. He's a master in uh, uh, multi ligament reconstruction, and his work in PCL reconstruction is recognized worldwide. He's going to talk today about PCL injury. Where are we today? Dr. Shriyash Kajar will kindly introduce our uh, guest speaker today, uh, followed by uh, his talk and a discussion. Dr. Jayaprasad Pedda and Dr. Nishit Shah have joined on as expert panel uh, today evening from the uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society side. And I, uh, I expect a good amount of discussion to happen today. So Shriyash, if you can kindly introduce Dr. James uh, for the benefit of all the viewers today. Uh, thank you, Dr. I.P. Soberai, and hello, everyone, and welcome to webinar number 101 on PCL injury, where are we today? Injuries to the posterior cruciate ligament and its treatment methods have historically been surrounded by controversy. The infrequent occurrence of PCL injuries and PCL-based multiligament knee injuries has led to limitations in clinical studies and a subsequent lag in basic science and clinical research when compared to other ligament injuries. And today, uh, we are privileged to have uh, an expert speaker on this topic, Dr. James Stannard from Missouri, USA. He's an internationally respected orthopedic trauma and complex knee injury surgeon. Currently, he's the medical director of the Missouri Orthopedic Institute, chairman, Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Hanzog with Distinguished Chair in Orthopedic Surgery, Associate Dean and Chief Medical Officer for Procedural Services. He completed his residency in orthopedic surgery from Brook Army Medical Center in Texas, uh, followed by a fellowship in orthopedic surgery and trauma from the Cancerpital St. Gallens uh, Switzerland Hospital. Before arriving into Missouri, Dr. Stannard completed 10 years of active service with the US Army. He received an Army Commendation Medal twice, three meritorious service medals and airborne wings from four different countries USA, Germany, Honduras, and South Africa. Later, he was section chief of the orthopedic trauma service at the University of Alabama at Birmingham from 1996 to 2009. He was named president of AO North America, an orthopedic education research foundation uh, society. He has served as an editor in chief of the Journal of Knee Surgery since 2010. And the textbook he's co-edited, namely the surgical treatment of orthopedic trauma is one of the best-selling textbooks in its field and is published in six languages. Over the years, he has received numerous awards and has more than 150 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters, including his vast experience on multiligament injuries and PCL injuries. Since 2010, he has served as associate head team physician for the University of Missouri's athletic department. So on behalf of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, I'd welcome Dr. James Stannard and invite him to Please give his talk on PCL injury. Where are we today? Can you please share your screen? Thank you. You bet. And thank you very much for having me. I hope that uh, the screen sharing is working okay. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to join you this morning for me and evening for you. I'd like to uh, bring everybody up to date on uh, how I'm viewing PCL injuries in 2020. This is a always changing field, uh, but it's a fascinating field to discuss. And we'll touch a little bit on multi-ligament knee injuries because most of the PCLs I see come from those, but we'll mostly concentrate on the PCL. Uh, the learning objectives that I hope that we can get through in this talk are first and foremost to understand the anatomy and to know exactly what it is we're trying to replace. Uh, some key points that I'd like to talk about a little bit are some relatively recent biomechanical studies. The idea of codominance between the two major bundles of the PCL, if there's any relatively newer thought process that has been really brought forward a lot by Robert Laprod in the last few years, it's the idea of codominance. I'd like you to understand what that is and, and possibly why double bundles might be worth considering in the PCL. We'll talk a little bit about 
suspensory fixation as a way of, of uh, fixing our graphs and why I used to use none of it and now I use almost nothing but. And I'll show you some research we've done that has led to that. A little bit about fiber tape augmentation. We've, we've gone to that with most of our graphs and we feel like it is providing some help and I'll discuss why we do that. And then I'll discuss the idea of transtibial inlay. So an arthroscopic way of doing the inlay as compared to only the open posterior tibia approach. And when I use each one, I realize I'm speaking to the arthroscopic society. We all like to keep things as minimally invasive as we can. And I think there's some very important points that make transtibial inlay something that is uh, very much an option. When we're talking about PCLs, it's important to realize that it is usually not an isolated injury. Again, it's usually part of multiple ligament knees. I do believe the incidence is increasing. As we see in, in uh, athletics, uh, bigger and bigger players, I think it happens more and more often. It's frequently high energy though, and I see it most often from uh, things like motor vehicle accidents and motorcycle accidents more so than on the field. Uh, it's important to assess the vascular status. And then this last picture I just brought up is to give us an idea of the topic that I'll bring up a little bit more later. And that's the idea of tunnel crowding. When we do have to deal with a multiple ligament knee, this is a depiction of all the tunnels that I would make if I was doing all four ligament groups. And you can see some of them start to get very close. So we'll talk a little bit about where this is important with the PCL. The posterior cruciate ligament in my mind is the cornerstone of the knee. It's the strongest ligament. It's the one that I think is really crucial to reestablish it in order to build the rest of the knee around it. So it's very, very important in my mind. For me, it's the first ligament that I reconstruct and it's the first one that I tension. I feel that in order to get the corners right, I have to have that middle cornerstone rebuilt first. It has a very large footprint as I'll show you in just a moment. And I think we need to keep that in mind and try to reconstruct that. And then I think the whole idea of conservative treatment does have to be mentioned. And, and I'll show you in the biomechanical studies that if you only lose one of the bundles of the PCL, either one, the amount of laxity is relatively limited. So if you have somebody who is not an elite athlete, you may be able to treat that conservatively, but you do have to realize that there is a high likelihood over time of getting medial compartment and patellofemoral arthritis and, uh, and that they will likely feel some lack of complete stability with deceleration. So slowing down from running and then also with going downstairs, things like that. So, uh, I, I do think conservative is an option. On the other hand, I would say that I think our reconstructions have become so good that if anybody is having difficulties when they're just a PCL and they don't feel like it's providing what they want, I think we have such good reconstructions now that it is okay to reconstruct even a isolated PCL. So you can do it conservatively, but I think if it's somebody who is really active, it's also okay to treat it surgically. This video I'm gonna probably play a couple of times. I really want you all to, to look at this and, and, and watch it. This is, is showing you the anatomy of the normal PCL. And as you watch it move, what I'd like you to concentrate on when I play it again is you've got this level, hopefully you can see my, my uh, uh, mouse hand here. Um, that's the posterior medial bundle. This is the anterior lateral bundle. Now you notice when the knee's in full extension, the posterior medial bundle is the one that is really tight. This is relatively lax. Watch as it flexes. When we get to about 90 degrees, this one becomes tight. And then when you get more to 120 or so, this one starts to loosen and this one tightens again. I also want you to notice how large this footprint is. I think those are the two things you wanna do. So let's play it one more time. And what you see again, tight, now it's loosening and this one's getting tight. Now this will loosen just a little right here at the end, right there as we get toward right there at 120 and the other one tightened. Now, as you see, when you really look at this, this isn't just two bundles, it's a hundred or so different fibers. We can't replicate that, but I do think we can replicate one bundle here and one bundle here. And I'll show you why I think that's important, even though I do not do double bundles with ACLs. I did for a while and I don't think it adds very much, but I do think in the PCL, it makes a difference. So here's the biomechanical studies that I was referring to. 
And I think there are a number of things that you have to consider. If you look at, this is a study of sectioning either the anterolateral by itself or the posterior medial by itself as compared to sectioning both. And what you can see here is the laxity when you have both sectioned is not too bad in full extension. It's less than, than, than two millimeters. But when you get up toward 90 and 105 and 120, it becomes very unstable when you have both sections. But look at when you section only one, that's the yellow and green bars here. And what you see is you do get a little bit of laxity even at 90 and 120, but it's really still only about three millimeters. And so this is why when you have a partial injury in many situations, you can get away with not treating that surgically and letting it heal. The biggest impacts are definitely at 90 to 105 degrees. Uh, but I'll show you with the idea of codominance, we'll revisit this in just a moment, how it, it is still important in my mind to reconstruct the posterior medial bundle and tension it at zero. This is another study, and this one looks at uh, the idea of posterior translation as well, and it shows you either sectioning the whole PCL or reconstructing with a single bundle is the green bar, or reconstructing with a double bundle. And what you notice here, and this is where the idea of codominance comes in. If you remember, when we do a single bundle, we all reconstruct the anterolateral bundle. That's the one that tightens at 90 degrees. So you can see here when you do a normal that's completely sectioned, you've got huge laxity like we talked about a minute ago. When you reconstruct with only a single bundle, you have a lot more laxity five millimeters or so in all the higher flexion angles. When you make it instead into a double bundle, remember the added bundle, the yellow bar is actually tight at, uh, at zero degrees. But the biggest difference that it makes is not at zero degrees, it's making the biggest difference at uh, 90 to 120 degrees. And this gets back to the idea of uh, of the two ligaments working together or codominance. Even though we're tightening it at zero, the two ligaments are working together. And the biggest difference that it makes by adding that extra bundle is not at zero, even though that's what we tightened it at. It's when we're around 75 to 120 degrees. That's where the big difference is. And that's the whole idea that Laprade talks about with codominance. I hope that as we go through, this will become more obvious. I'm gonna show you a study that we did here at Missouri that demonstrates the same thing. So um, classically, the anterior lateral and posterior medial bundles are thought to function independently. The idea of codominance is that that's not true. They work together synergistically. And so the one you tighten at zero actually has a very significant impact when you're at 75 to 120 degrees of flexion. And that's because changes in the orientation of those bundles as you go through flexion and extension. So like we saw when I ran the video, they prevent either bundle from completely being the only one functioning in posterior restraint, but they're working together. So is one reconstruction technique the best? Is there one that I can tell you, this is the way you have to do it? I don't think so. I think anytime we get dogmatic and say, you must do it this way, that we're probably making a mistake. There is more than one way to do it. But I'd like to show you this study that we published uh, with a partner of mine, Clay Nelly, in the Journal of Knee Surgery in 2017. And we looked at five different techniques trying to determine is one better than the other. And we looked at arthroscopic single bundle inlay, suspensory fixation single bundle in uh, uh, PCL, open onlay single bundle, so open on the tibia, putting it on, open inlay, double bundle, that's what I used to do almost exclusively, and then arthroscopic inlay double bundle, which is my most common one now. And what we found in all of these was that the double bundle was the closest one to native. This was our testing setup, and each one of these reconstructions was done by a surgeon who this was their primary way of doing it, so that we could see the real masters doing the technique. So I didn't do the single bundle, for example, because I don't do those very often, but I did a number of the double bundle ones. And that shows again how we tested. When you look at stiffness, and I'm gonna go through all three of these, and, and then we'll look at, 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 at how it gives. 
compare on the far left here, and unfortunately my arrow now is, oh, it's working again, good. This is the native intact. On this side are two of the double bundle techniques. And so I'd like you to notice that in stiffness, at zero degrees, again, they're all pretty close. But when we add the posterior medial bundle, which we tightened at zero, look at when you go out here to 90 degrees. Now the ones that are closest to the native are the double bundles where we added an extra bundle we tightened at zero. At first thought, that doesn't make sense. But when you understand codominance, it does. We find the same thing when we look at laxity. When you get at zero, they're all pretty close, single and double. The closest though, again, is that that inlay, I'm sorry, um, it's the arthroscopic inlay is the very closest to the native. But as you get up here to the 90 degree, definitely the closest was my arthroscopic inlay double bundle. Next was my open inlay double bundle. So again, we see codominance playing a role here. When you look at the load that it, it, it has up to five millimeters of displacement. So how much load did you have to give it in Newtons to get five millimeters? Again, at zero, they're all pretty close. In extension, they all do the job. But when you go over here to 90 degrees, by far the double bundle techniques, all three of these are different double bundle techniques, were by far the best and very much the closest to the, the native. So this is again, the idea of codominance. When we add a bundle at zero, it really makes a difference when we're flexed. It's very important though. My very good friend, Greg Finelli will tell you that he did a study where he looked at double bundle versus single bundle and he didn't see a difference clinically. When you talk to Greg, you will find that he tightened both bundles at the same flexion angle. That makes no difference. All you're doing then is filling the footprint and having a large footprint. In ours, it's very important to understand we're tightening that anterior lateral bundle. So that's this one at 90 degrees. We're tightening the posterior medial, the extra bundle at zero degrees of flexion. That's critical. If you don't do that, then there's no reason to do a double bundle. What about autograft? If you're in a place where you can't get allograft, and if I remember correctly, I think in India, you do have access to allograft. I will just tell you that it is possible. Um, this is when I went to Brazil with a friend of mine. We reconstructed a very good soccer player's PCL and we made this graft and we, we combined uh, a quadriceps with a bone block from the quadriceps and then harvested semitendinosus. So you can do it, you can get enough width, you can make a double bundle. The only problem is you have to take two different things. In this case, our bone was a little bit smaller so we didn't take away too much. Uh, we use smaller screws. I use a 4.5 millimeter screw when I'm doing the bony block inlay uh, in, in, with using an allograft. This I used two 3.5 millimeter screws instead. So that way I could, I could do it and not break the smaller bone. And I put the two screws like that. So graft fixation, let's talk about that for a minute. Suspensory fixation is something that I had never done literally until I came here to the University of Missouri and I got with my very good friend, Jimmy Cook, who is a veterinary orthopedic surgeon and a wonderful researcher in addition. And he runs our research labs. And Jimmy challenged me, why did I only use interference fixation? And I didn't really have a great answer except that's how I was taught and that's what I did. So we did a study first in the, in the research labs, then in dogs, and then eventually in humans. And we used compared fixed suspensory fixation to interference fixation. And this was an example of the study. We looked at anterior loading with a weight bearing angle. And that was the graft only versus a completely intact native control in the other knee. So we compared the grafts in this case, to a native control. And this was an ACL study, but the concept is the same whether we use ACL or PCL. And if you look, the blue is suspensory fixation. The green is our control normal, and the red is, is our uh, screw. And what we found was, again, they're all pretty close, and they all do the job pretty well when you're at, at uh, uh, looking at, at just one millimeter uh, displacement using uh, forces on it. But as you get bigger forces, and look at how many Newtons that it takes to get to four millimeters of displacement, now it starts to make a difference. It's also closer with the suspensory in terms of stiffness. So it, it 
relatively replicates much closer the normal control. Uh, so it had a higher load with suspensory at two, three, and four millimeters than the screw. Suspensory was stiffer than the screw, which we really don't want. I, I'm sorry, which we want and, and matches it more. And then the suspensory graft alone was about 50% of the intact control. None of the suspensory failed, one of the screws failed. This is where it gets really interesting though, if you look at the histology. So a normal ACL looks like what you can see here. You can see the alignment of the fibers is very organized and very good. When you go over here to the suspensory, it's not quite the same, but you can see it still has a very organized structure that is still there. Look at the screw and how disorganized the collagen is. And it's because it's working by friction and by crushing the graft against the bony wall. And that really doesn't leave you with nearly as nice of an alignment of your collagen. You see a hypercellularity, hypervascularity, and then the collagen fiber remodeling. When we looked at sections of it, you could notice that it's all graft and bone. And then here's our suspensory. Whereas here, you've got this large man-made element that's sitting in your bone. When you looked at it with the integration, the suspensory integrated very differently. And I'll show you a little closer up here in just a second. There was actually no aperture widening with the suspensory. The screw had a little bit, but this is what I found really interesting. When you look at the healing of the ligament or, or, or uh, of your graft to the bone, this is our interference. And what you see is just graft and then straight to bone. It's not a normal healing like we see in the human body. When you go over here to the suspensory, you see normal four zones from collagen to starting to become cartilage going to bone. It, this is what a normal insertion looks like in the human body. And the suspensory is what replicated that by far the best. So you're seeing a much more natural healing histologically when you go with the suspensory fixation. And then when we looked at quadriceps tendon and internal brace, what we found again was that the, the displacement when we added the internal brace with the tendon, stiffness was almost identical with normal. Load to failure was very close and displacement was also very close at 100 newtons, even after a thousand cycles. So it was not statistically different from the native. So that's what got me to switch over to all suspensory. This is what my arthroscopic PCL graft looks like. And you can see that we've got it built here. It has all graft, and this is a, a, a uh, Achilles tendon graft source, because I do these with allograft. We don't use any bone, which makes the passage much easier. It's all arthroscopic. And then we drill sockets using a flip cutter rather than full tunnels. When we talk about the issue of tunnel crowding, you will see that that's very important. And we also add the fiber tape that's in here to augment it. So why add the fiber tape? What, what's the purpose of that? And it, it, the idea behind it is it provides a synthetic load sharing mechanism that during that early healing phase where we're going through cellular repopulation, revascularization and integration, where the graft is getting weak, it functions a lot like a, a shoulder harness in your seatbelt. If you don't have an abnormal load, it doesn't do anything. But if you get an abnormal load during this period when the graft is the weakest, it can provide a safety belt that will prevent you from losing your graft during that critical healing phase. And that's really all it's there for. Okay, what about the anatomy? The concept of the killer turn that was put out by Berg and others starting in about 1996. So this is a long time ago that, that this was brought up. I had just finished my training. That corner though, depending upon where you put your graft can approach 140 degrees. And that leaves you with a big risk of abrasion of your graft against the back of the bone here and late loosening as it stretches out. If you will make your arthroscopic tunnel lower, like what this green arrow is indicating. And this is where Greg Finelli taught me that can replicate an open inlay technique 
because it changes that 140 degree to two separate turns, each of which are much smaller. And that one has held up really well during reconstructions. So if you look back, this is from a long time ago also, but it was the lead article in April of 2002 in the American Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And what they found was when they did normal transtibials, and that was with the higher location that most people use exiting on the back of the, the uh, tibia, they found that a third of them failed prior to 2000 cycles. None of the inlay grafts failed. And probably more importantly, they found graft thinning in 41% of the transtibials at that killer turn, only 13% of the inlays. And then graft elongation of almost a centimeter in the transtibials compared to about six millimeters at the, at the inlay. And the whole issue there is you could reconstruct and easily end up with a one or two plus laxity because of this really tight killer turn. So you end up with a lot where you redid it and it's one or two plus, it's not tight. That got me going on the concept of the open inlay with a large bone block that was placed under the tibial plateau and I found that it really did eliminate that one to two plus laxity. It let me be very aggressive in my rehabilitation protocol. And it was trying to deal with this killer turn, but I also added the two functional bundles and reconstructed the large footprint. So here's what my graft would look like in, when I did those ones. It's a big bone block here. And then you've got about two thirds of the graft of this Achilles tendon is your anterior lateral bundle. And about a third or so is your posterior medial bundle. It's about 20 millimeters long. 15 millimeters wide and at least 10 millimeters thick. So you don't break the bone when you tighten the screw. It's very important when you do this, you're coming right here on the posterior medial edge of the tibia, just behind the MCL. And you must stay on bone because it's been shown uh, by Mark Miller that you average about 22 millimeters between the back of the tibia and the neurovascular bundle. But I've looked and I've found some of my patients as, as low as five millimeters. So you must stay on the bone to make sure you don't have a very bad vascular injury. If you do that, you've got your medial head of the gastrocnemius and your popliteus between you and the artery in a normal situation. I see my semitendinosus and gracilis tendons, and then I'm right along the posterior edge of the tibia. And I make my incision right through there. This is with my blunt homin in place, it's hooked over the edge of the, uh, the lateral edge of the tibia. And I've got my medial head of the gastroc and my popliteus back and protecting me. Then I will take a curved half, half inch uh, osteotome and I will make a trough, a bony trough right here. And there you can see the piece of bone. This is with the graft in place. So I've got it right in the middle of the knee it's a 4.5 millimeter screw with a washer. I drill the bone block at 4.5, so it has a lag function. It is a cannulated screw. And then here are my two bundles. And that's what it looks like. So how does that work? Well, it works well. It gives you a very stable knee if you're willing to make that big incision and take the risks with the vascular structures. This is one that I reported in 2009 in Operative Techniques in Sports Medicine, and it was 50 PCL reconstructions with an, a long follow-up, average of 56 months. One of them was as, as much as 117 months. Four patients failed the initial PCL reconstruction, so that was 8%. All of them were successfully revised using the same technique. So our total failure rate with this was 7%, but we, these were all multiple ligament knees, and we ended up with a very good range of motion, an average of 2 to 124 degrees. So it really reconstructed it well. Most importantly though, 88% had zero in terms of, of motion. It was very, very, very tight, a grade zero. When you looked at KT2000 data, it was actually slightly tighter, 0 0.07 millimeters, almost exactly the same, but slightly tighter at 30 degrees and then one millimeter looser at 70. So we really replicated the, the normal knee uh, comparing it to their other knee. Lysholm knee score averaged 91, very good. IKDC, 71% of these multiple ligament knees were either normal or near normal. So you don't end up with a sloppy knee. Very importantly though, what that allowed me to do was a very aggressive rehabilitation protocol. I would allow immediate weight bearing is tolerated. I ask them to use their crutches for a week just to give them uh, some, some stability while their quadriceps comes back, but they could put as much weight as they wanted to on it. And then immediate range of motion zero to 30 degrees. 
and advance it up to at 90 by four to six weeks. So I don't give it time to start getting scar. That lets me get very, very aggressive. And I think that's important. So let's go back quickly to those two functional bundles. This is what we're looking at. You've got your anterior lateral bundle. It's named because it's more lateral on the tibia and more anterior with the knee and extension on the femur. It's the bigger one, it's tight in flexion, and it's the one that we all reconstruct. The posterior medial is the smaller of the two, as you see depicted here. It's tightest in extension, like I showed you on that video, but because of codominance, it has a huge impact in flexion. So remember that concept of codominance that Rob Laprade has really come up with beautifully. Again, I already talked about Greg Finelli and why he showed no difference with double bundles, so I'm not going to go there again, but you must tighten these at 90 degrees of difference for it to make a difference. So again, this is the study that showed the idea of codominance, and when you add the extra bundle at zero degrees, it makes the biggest difference at 75 to 120 degrees. What does the literature say? The literature is not clear. I can't give you a good level one study that proves that this is better. There are lots of biomechanical studies that say it, but I can't give you a good level one study that shows that. The, the meta-analysis by Zhao is probably as good as anything. He had three randomized controlled studies and eight other high quality studies. And he found that double bundle was significantly better at 90 degrees. You added one at zero, it made the biggest difference at 90 because of codominance. And there was a significantly better likelihood they would end up IKDC grade A with a double bundle. Again, lots of biomechanical studies, Laprod and others, ours as well, showed less posterior translation when you got to angles that were greater than 15 degrees because of the codominance. Now, you're an arthroscopic society. We all like arthroscopy. Can you make this happen by doing a transtibular inlay? And the answer is yes, but it's very important that you come out. Look at how low I'm coming out here on the back of the tibia. This is going to give me a, a, a socket right here, which is much lower. Most people end up way up here. That will allow me to have two smaller curves rather than most people come out here and it's a very sharp curve. So you can do an arthroscopic transtibial technique that will give you the same effect, but don't go where I just drew, go where I'm showing you right here. And that allows two separate curves, each of which is less acute. And that'll take care of the killer term. So when I'm doing it arthroscopically, I come out very low here and have two separate smaller turns rather than one sharp turn. Again, I've gone over these, so I'm just showing you again, the double bundle techniques, these two on the far right, were by far the closest in terms of laxity, stiffness, and everything else to the intact PCL. Whoops, sorry about that. See if I can go backwards. So when you look at these three PCL reconstructions, this one is what I think you should not do. It comes high up and makes a very sharp curve. This is my arthroscopic technique that I think works fine. Come much lower and two separate curves, neither of which is as acute. Or this is also fine, open posterior tibial inlay, bone block, and that works well also. I think the incidence of these is rising. Why is that? So you see all these American football pictures of people that have knees that are not functioning like they're supposed to because of the hits that they're taking. This is rising and it's rising because people are getting so big. So if you look, this is me in 1981 playing for the university that I went to, which was Brown University. I'm not that big for playing as, as a lineman. I'm a lot smaller than this guy, um, but this was me playing on the defensive line. This is my son, Michael, from about three years ago. He's playing for Missouri. He would be blocking against me with the position he played, but Michael is 70 pounds heavier than I was, and he's also stronger. I was faster, but uh, the forces are so great because they're big and fast that I think we're seeing more of them, and you're seeing more multiple ligament knees from sports. Remember, they often will spontaneously reduce, so you have to really carefully examine and check their vascular. I also think, at least in the United States, we have increasing stupidity. So you see this guy has 1,100 pounds on the bar. And here he is trying to do it. And he's being very stupid. And that didn't work out very well. So what did that do? That did this. These are his two knees. Bilateral dislocations from doing stupid things. 
So I do think we see more in sports because of either size or stupidity or both. This is again, the concept of tunnel crowding. And since we're talking about PCLs, I'm gonna focus on that. But this is my tunnels if I do an ACL, a PCL, a posterior medial corner, and a posterior lateral corner. And you can see this is a lot of sockets and that's why they're drawn like they are. That's the socket. And then this is the rest of the thin area going across for my suspensory fixation. When we're talking about a PC, an ACL, then what you have to watch is uh, the posterior lateral corner socket versus the femoral socket for the ACL. If we're talking about a PCL, it's the posterior medial corner and the double bundle PCL. And you do have to watch this very closely. It's actually the, the posterior medial bundle of, the, of my double bundle gets very close to my posterior medial corner. So those are the two you have to really watch. And then you have to watch a little bit with my double bundle uh, technique. I'm, I'm sorry, with my posterior medial corner, the, the um, uh, posterior oblique ligament here, you have to watch also uh, because it can get very close to your tibial tunnel. So there's two things you have to really watch when you're talking about PCL and posterior medial corner. So how would I summarize all this in inlay versus transtibial? I do think it's very important to do a double bundle. Codominance is true. It's stronger biomechanically. There's some literature that supports it and it's not that hard to do. It's really worth doing. But what type of procedure, inlay versus arthroscopic? For me, I use that big bone block and in inlay in a couple of situations. I do it if they're obese. I do it if it's a fracture dislocation so that I can get really good stability. In most other situations, including most multi-ligament knees, I do it with the transtibial technique now. If it's a really badly unstable multi-ligament knee where I have all of those sockets that you just saw, so a KD4 using Bob Skank's classification, I will use the bone block. Anything else, I will use the transtibial. So I probably do about 65, 70% transtibial now. Remember that large footprint. It's very important and you want to replicate that. Remember that you can do that with a double bundle and make it very natural. So let's really quickly run through a case to show you just the concepts that you have to think about. This was a 39 year old. This one's a fracture dislocation. I'm not going to talk about the plateau fracture though. It was an extreme skateboarding injury. How should, you, how should we proceed with this? Well, the first thing we have to do is take care of the bone. So we did a spanning external fixer first and it looks a lot better now than it did. So that, that helped. Then we need to get good imaging so we know what we're dealing with. You need to make sure the vascular supply is okay and the nerve, look at your skin and soft tissues, and then we'll determine a plan for both the bone and the soft tissue. So this guy was a mess. You start to see structures where they don't belong when you get your MRI scan. And I'm a big believer in MRI scanning tibial plateaus. If you guys want to, if you like multiple ligament knees, become friends with your trauma partners, get them to get an MRI and watch how much business you have from high energy trauma. There are a lot of these injuries. Too many of my trauma colleagues don't look at it and they don't know how to fix it. So in those cases, you need to become friends with them and you take care of it. Again, as we keep looking, you can see the meniscus is turned the wrong way because of a bucket handle. You can see that we start to get into situations where we've got missing menisci. We've got uh, uh, situations with ligaments that are not working. You've got what looks like a PCL with a big bone avulsion. That PCL was not in good condition when we looked at it arthroscopically. And then you've got here, look, look at this lateral meniscus. You're seeing three sections all together. That's not a good sign. It was destroyed. So how should we handle the soft tissues after the bone is rebuilt? That's what we really want to talk about here. Again, you've got your bucket handle tear here with a double PCL sign. Um, you've got it very obviously here as well. You're completely missing your lateral meniscus because it's shredded and going down the back of the knee. Uh, it, it's things that you don't want to see. Uh, again, you, you need to really put the whole picture together and you need to be able to handle all of these areas because all of the different areas of the knee were damaged in addition to this fracture. You might be able to salvage this PCL, but in this case, we weren't able to. Again, here's that lateral meniscus going down the back of the tibia. That's not gonna be salvageable. We're gonna have to have a transplant for that. 
lots of injuries, including the bone. So you got to make a plan. What we had was a medial tibial plateau fracture. ACL was avulsed. PCL was avulsed. Maybe we could save those. Maybe we couldn't. Lateral collateral ligament, deep MCL, completely displaced and flipped bucket handle medial meniscus and a destroyed lateral meniscus, as well as missing articular cartilage, as you will see here. So we did the bone first, and this is what we got that to look like. So looks reasonable. I like to do that if I can within the first seven to 10 days, as soon as the soft tissues will let me. I like to wait until we're about three or four weeks to let the capsule heal a little bit so that I can do a lengthy arthroscopy procedure and not worry as much about compartments. At that point, we went in with the arthroscope. We needed to get the, I, I actually did put the arthroscope in just to flip the bucket handle back on the first surgery when I did the bone. I didn't want to leave that displaced in the notch. So we flipped it back and just put one stitch to hold it and then came back. That's our lateral meniscus or lack of it gone down. This is the missing cartilage and it was weight bearing in part of it. And so that was a problem and it involved the whole posterior horn area. And then this is what some of the ligaments looked like. So this was repairing the bucket handle. The ACL was salvageable that ligament was in good shape. And so we used the scorpion here and we're able to pull that down and bring that in place. The PCL was not, it was not good, but that was a good ACL. So we've got now our, our challenge. Take this picture with all these tunnels and sockets, because this now includes my, media, my lateral meniscus transplant sockets. Now add my tibial plate and screws. And you can see this idea of tunnel crowding becomes a huge issue. You've got to understand where all these things are or you're going to get into trouble trying to do this. So we came back. We did a double bundle PCL. We had repaired our ACL. This is our graft again. It's using our, our uh, suspensory fixation. It's using our double bundle with no, I'm sorry, we did use bone here because I had so much damage to the bone. I did an open tibial inlay arthroscopic procedure in this case. So there's my bone. And then we ended up replacing this with a lateral meniscus transplant with articular cartilage. So here's the graft we replaced it with to get that cartilage back, as well as this is a live meniscus. So it's live articular cartilage, live meniscus. And this was seeing how wide we'd need to be able to be measuring the defect. Then we added a posterior medial corner reconstruction. Again, you see our fiber tapes augmenting. So back to the PCL key points to, to summarize this. Anatomic PCLs can be done either with an inlay technique on the tibia or with a transtibial technique. And certain very specific times I want to use the big bone block. The other times I do the transtibial. Trans -tibial. And it just gets down to doing the arthroscopic with the low tibial insertion. That's what's important there. Should you do a double bundle? I absolutely believe it's worth it in this case. The co-dominant relationship that I hope I've explained well enough that you understand. Rob LaProd writes about it. So if you want to read more about it, he's got a very nice summary article that was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in the last year or two. Um, you must tighten these two bundles though at different places. So you want to tighten the poster meal bundle at full extension like you see here. You want to tighten the anterolateral lateral bundle at 90 to 100 degrees of flexion. And then you also are replicating that large footprint. And you can see how much we fill that footprint and we have our two separate bundles. It's the cornerstone of the knee. It's critical. We have to get this back if we want to get back to a good functional knee. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I, I hope that this has uh, been helpful to you all. Uh, I, I hope one day we get through this crazy pandemic and we can spend some time together potentially. But I've really enjoyed being with you and, and, uh, and really enjoyed talking to you about this topic. I'll stop sharing my screen now so that we can all visit and discuss. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, for that excellent uh, talk. And importantly, outlining certain key uh, areas of controversy in the present day as far as uh, managing PCL injury goes. So I'd just like to invite my uh, co-panelists to uh, ask their questions. And then towards the end, uh, if you have time, then I'll come out with my question. Thank you. So maybe Jay Prasad, if you have any yeah, questions, yeah, yeah, Jay Prasad, you can start. Uh, uh, hi, James. Who yeah, your voice is a bit low, Jay Prasad. So if you can. Yeah, this question, uh, James. I guess able to yeah. hear. Yeah. Yeah. So James, this question is uh, well, see uh, in athletes, 
where they like uh, footballers uh, where they need to have a flexion when they are playing uh, if those patients having a partial tear partial tear like one bundle uh, tear like am am bundle or uh, pl bundle uh, so which bundle you will um, uh, reconstruct or you reconstruct double bundle for those patients so it depends on the partial tear i'm actually dealing with this with one of our football players right now and i've got one that looks to me, his exam is actually pretty stable but when you get the mri scan it doesn't look good he's got multiple other ligaments out so what i'm going to do is look very carefully at that pcl the other thing i didn't discuss and we don't have good data yet but it's i was just talking to jimmy cook our research director that we really need to to look at this in the lab now is what is the role with a partial tear cuz this person his pcl is is one I hope I, I'm not going to have to reconstruct. But on the lateral corner, he definitely has a partial tear and there's some good fibers there. So what's the role in that situation of leaving the, the ligaments that are partially torn and supplementing it with something like a fiber tape uh, and, and doing so, so not full reconstruction, but giving it some support while it's going through the healing. And I don't think we have good answers to that yet. Uh, so in this case, when I go in there, I'm going to look very carefully at it and I might just supplement with fiber tape or I might add a graft and it just depends on how it looks when I get in there. Uh, supplementing the fiber tape or augmented with the fiber tape, is there any chance of tethering the original graft with the fiber tape? You could. And so you're going to have to be careful if you do that, where you place it. Um, and, and that's where you have to, you have to really watch or if you're doing a small graft to supplement. Uh, and and, and I, I didn't, I guess I didn't answer fully your, your last question. If I were reconstructing only one, I always need to make sure the anterior lateral bundle is there and is good. It's the bigger and stronger of the two. But I do think the posterior medial is very important. So the, the answer to your previous was I would do both, but maybe I would do something like a fiber tape supplementation. You can get by with a very, very small tunnel if you're only doing fiber tape. So if you're trying to augment rather than, re, than redo the reconstruction. I think that would be a positive of the fiber tape is you can get by with as small as a 2.4 or so millimeter tunnel to get it through. So there, then you won't damage as much. Now you've got to be careful where you place it so that it doesn't stretch across as you're going through flexion and extension and, and, and damage. So I do think you have to watch that carefully. For the most part, I have only in a couple of cases done only the fiber tape to augment as compared to adding fiber tape plus a graft. Most of the time I've added a graft, but I think we need to look at that in the lab and consider. Right. Shall I? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, you uh, showed the graft history uh, in the sense of the bio screw and the suspensory fixation. Uh, the slides, they're very beautiful. Just wanted to know that after how much time uh, these slides were created after the, let us say, the, what was the follow-up period? So the follow-up, this was a canine or dog study, and it was at six months. Um, now, now in dogs that, you know, one year equals seven years is the concept that they've always said. So that, that would be the equivalent in a human study of more, more like, uh, you know, seven times six months or three and a half years. Um, so it, they were very well healed and back, you know, running normally and acting normally before, uh, before that, that, uh, graft was, was obtained back to see how it had healed in. Okay. Uh, so, see, we have a problem of not having allografts. Oh, you don't? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, so what we now, uh, we used to do a PCL two bundles or something. The other problem also we are facing is uh, finance, financial problem. So, lately we have been able we are doing uh, more of an augmentation by keeping one bundle and uh, uh, doing anterolateral bundle because that is the main bundle that we have. And to our surprise, the people who are doing it, and I'm sure that my colleagues here will agree to us, that somehow we have seen much better result when we do augmentation, single bundle augmentation, which is common, most commonly done in our part of the world. Uh, so, what is your what are your thoughts about this so what i think i i didn't realize that that i've only had the honor of being in india once and that was last year in november so obviously i wasn't as attuned to the the fact that you don't have 
access to the allographs. Um, I think it's even more important than for us to get those studies done in the lab. And, and maybe uh, we, some of us can do it together at some point. We have very good labs here. But I think that it, what might really work well for you is to, uh, I do believe in augmenting the, the single bundle, but it would really be nice to add another set of fiber tape and make yourself a poster medial bundle out of fiber tape so that you would have your big bundle augmented with a single fiber tape and then maybe a couple or something to make a poster medial bundle. That way you don't have to take so much graft away from the patient, uh, but you are able to uh, replicate a double bundle. So I've never done that. It would be fun now that, now that I know that, that uh, you all don't have access either. If we, if we get going on this in the lab, because again, I just talked yesterday with our research director about it. I'd love to look at a double bundle where we're doing the poster medial all out of synthetic and see what that does. Because I think that if done right, that could give you the codominance while still only taking one graft, which would be nice. Because otherwise, can you do a double bundle when you use all autograft? You can, and we did it in Brazil, but that was an isolated PCL. If you're dealing with a multi-ligament knee, it becomes very tough because you just don't have enough graft. Nishita, unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. The inlay technique, it was very beautiful. Uh, so let us say that if you have to do only autograft, how will you take that, that big chunk of bone? So that, that was a quadriceps tendon. And so we took a, a piece from the patella and then uh, and uh, a quadriceps tendon. So, so big piece of patella, you can do it without any problems, right? It wasn't as big as the, so the allograft I showed you was yeah. 15 millimeters wide. The autograft wasn't, it was, it was the equivalent of what you would do if you did either a, a quadriceps ACL or, or a, a, a bone patellar tendon bone ACL. So it was about a third of the width of the patellar tendon, that amount of bone. So it's not quite as big as when I do an allograft, I do bigger because we, we can get away with that. Perfect. I so let's talk about this concept of co-dominance and I have read that paper from Laprade and really it's good work and, I, and you know you wonderfully reasoned out. Uh, I just have a, a, a question now if you look at biomechanical studies it says that the PM bundle uh, uh, give stability in extension. And here the concept of co-dominant actually says that by reinforcing it or, you know, by reconstructing a PM bundle, you're going to add stability in flexion. How do we explain that? What, what, what has been your view on this? And that's, so when, when and, and I, I know I went very quickly through our study, but Laprade hadn't yet come out with the concept of co-dominance when we did our study. Um, and, and when we first got the results and I looked at our double bundles and they, they were good at, at, at full extension, but they weren't that much different at full extension where it made the huge difference was at 90 to 120 degrees of flexion. And, and I looked at our research director and I said, I don't understand. I add a bundle at zero and the difference is really the most obvious when you get to significant flexion. And, and I, it made no sense to me. The, the, but but it's, it's true in our study and it's true in the biomechanical study that I showed you that was uh, published uh, uh, by, uh, I think it was Widgex in, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. All of those showed the double bundle making the biggest difference between about 70 and 120 degrees. And the only way you can, you can explain it is this thought that there, these, these two bundles really aren't. And if you go back to that video that I showed, they're really not two bundles. There are a hundred bundles. There, there are a lot of fibers and we can't replicate what nature or God gave us, but we can get two. And again, it's critical. You tighten them at the different degrees and then they work together all the way through flexion and extension. So while the zero is tightest, I'm sorry, while the posterior medial is tightest at zero, it's working together with the anterior lateral at 90 to 110 or 20 degrees. And so it's making the most noticeable difference really at that. It, it, it doesn't make logical sense when you first think about it, 
But if you go in the lab, it absolutely happened. Laprade showed it. We showed it in our study. And, and at first, I just didn't, I didn't understand why is that? And, and that's the whole, that's the whole idea of codominance. And, and if, if, if no, everyone comes away with nothing except the codominance out of this, I think, I think that's really important because it doesn't make sense when you first think about it, but it's absolutely there when you do biomechanical studies. James? Yes. Good job, sir. Yeah. So in uh, single, yeah. bundle, uh, in double bundle, uh, which bundle has to be uh, uh, tightened first? I, I almost always tighten the anterior lateral bundle first. So I put the knee at 90 to 100 degrees, tighten the anterior lateral, and then go to full extension and tighten the posterior medial. The other advantage that I, I neglected to talk about when I talked about the suspensory is that I will tighten it, then I'll go do my other ligaments, then I'll come back, tighten it again, then I'll range the knee, stress the knee, and I'll tighten it again. And we'll usually go through about four cycles of retightening. And that takes the creep out of the graft. And I think that's another huge benefit because with the in interference screw, you only get one chance to, to pull it tight. And so I do think that's another uh, advantage I, I didn't talk about is that with the suspensory, you can go back and tighten it multiple times and take the creep out. Uh, sorry, Jim, I, I had some uh, internet issues, so I just uh, kind of logged off. Uh, uh, I just, so along the lines of uh, co-dominance, are we trying to say that perhaps what we're doing with the PM bundle is restoring the function of the meniscofemoral ligaments, which, uh, which studies have shown is that the tensile properties of the two meniscofemoral ligaments are equivalent to the PM bundle. So is that what we're trying to achieve uh, doing the second bundle reconstruction? That might explain part of why it's changing things at 90 degrees. I, I think it does add at zero as well, a little bit. Um, but may, maybe you may be right. It may be, may be the, uh, the meniscofemoral uh, ligaments getting them back and going uh, because those are usually not functional in a big knee dislocation either. And so th maybe that partially explains why the codominance occurs. Right. And along the lines of what my colleagues mentioned that, yes, in India, we don't have allografts. So we are reliant on autographs, and especially in the uh, multi-league situations, you know, we, we would be struggling in terms of graft. Now, uh, I do understand, and you know, you very nicely highlighted the importance of certain concepts in reconstructing the inlay and the double bundle. But now that as our techniques of PCL reconstruction evolve, say in some, somebody like our country where there are financial concerns, at the same time, we are only uh, limited with autographs. And because we've now modified our techniques and added something like an internal brace, and then we are going on to an all inside type of uh, <laughs> procedure. <laughs> would you think that, that would uh, really help in achieving the stability, which what you have shown in your studies with the advantage of the inlay and the double bundle? I think so. So I, like I said, I, I really think we need to do some good studies now using uh, the, the internal brace. So I, I think even more importantly in a country like yours where you don't have access to the allograft at this point, and, and I don't know if that'll change in the future or not. I, I know there's cultural and religious and other issues that probably play a role. I, I've done a lot of speaking and have good friends in Brazil and it, it's interesting over the last 15 years or so they've started to get access when they had none. But while you don't have any access to it, I think the, the concept I would really look at and, and that knowing that now, if we, if we get things going in the lab to look at it, I would, I would like to look at a double bundle where we use augmented uh, anterior lateral bundle and then do a bigger augmentation, only synthetic for the posterior medial. And I'll bet you we could make that work and make it to where you don't have to have uh, advantages of the codominance. Correct. And the other reason which I uh, I did mention earlier is that we have smaller knees. So, you know, the footprint is smaller. So again, to get a double bundle, uh, uh, it could be challenging. Uh, so yeah, yes. no, that, that's great to know. Uh, uh, now, in terms of, we didn't touch on, uh, obviously in the interest of time, we didn't talk about isolated PCL injuries. So let's talk about a, a grade two uh, PCL with with residual laxity in a symptomatic patient. Now, obviously, uh, I believe that the first line of treatment would be non-operative, and I believe my panel would agree. 
but say somewhere down the line because studies have clearly shown that five years down the line if the patient has ongoing issues and you uh, decide to just manage it non operatively there'll be cartilage and further meniscal deterioration sure so sure yes may i sir. ask you one thing yes when you are talking about grade 2 pcl injury yes. when is when when is when is patient is you are talking about like one month two months six months 12 12 months after injury no that's what i was coming to that suppose you okay. say you you identify an isolated pcl injury on day 1 and obviously mm. most of us will agree to treat it non operatively but say 3 months down the line after proper trial of rehab the patient continues to be symptomatic uh, and you know one of the other reasons why we may be reluctant to offer surgery right away would be uh, say an overweight or an obese patient but we know that if left unattended if the knee is going to deteriorate with time in this symptomatic group so my question is is there a role of offering pcl surgery in this patient and also you know we can't rely on imaging because 6 month down the line what is a torn pcl might have healed but it's just that it's lax so it gives us a false uh, you know impression yes yeah, so my my philosophy on that is first of all i think that our our um our teaching that that on an isolated one that you don't need to do surgery that came from the days where we would do a PCL reconstruction and they often ended up with 2 plus laxity after the reconstruction i think we've gotten much better reconstructions now and and so i think it you can make a much stronger case for treating it surgically if they're symptomatic and if they're loose after a trial of 3 or 6 months um i think you can make a case and what i would do is i i would i i always do try it first non operatively but i let them know at the very beginning that if it doesn't heal where it's tight that what they have to understand is it'll probably bother them going downstairs and they have a much higher risk of becoming arthritic as time goes on and and so we have to balance those two things and so what i will do in that situation if we've gone through a prop, appropriate rehab and appropriate brace to let it heal I will then discuss with them the option of reconstructing it if they have failed with the initial approach. It's a small percentage of my patients because I'm dealing mostly with multiple ligament knees, but but I do think it's appropriate as long as you've given it a trial and then it's just a discussion, let's say they're 2 plus, but they have a good endpoint. It's a discussion with the patient that either we need to really keep your muscles built up, use bracing and go non-operatively. but do understand you have a bigger risk of becoming arthritic as time goes on or we can shift gears and do this surgically but now you're going to take on the risks of surgery if we do that and you have to rehabilitate it pr- properly so i do think there's a place for that if they have failed and i've done it and it's usually been in really active people soldiers i did one in a professional rodeo cowboy who was a bull rider um i think i've done a couple policemen and firemen and so people that are real active if they failed the conservative i think i think it's right to offer to reconstruct as long as they understand the risks both ways yes nishit yes yeah uh, james uh, thank you uh, the the thing is that you said that the pcl uh, in 75 to 120 it is maximally loaded right so in this country everybody sits on the ground and 90% of our patients they use indian toilets where you need full flexion and full extension okay so and many of them i think most of them my colleagues will agree with me that they come after three or four months of their injury because they are symptomatic so do you think that these patients should be given a trial of conservative management So I guess that would depend so so flexion is really important you're saying just for simple activities of daily living yes in India. so yes that, that that changes things a little bit um yeah. so there uh, I do not think it's wrong if you have the discussion with the patient and say look we can try conservative for 3 to 6 months if you would like and then if you don't heal with a really tight knee we can come back and do a reconstruction I don't think it's wrong now with our good anatomic reconstructions if you say or if you would like we can reconstruct it now you don't so have to What will be a conservative management I'm in sorry? this patient what will be the conservative management in this patient 
So if I did conservative, I would get a brace that's designed which, for a PCL. Which, which brace? Like, like what we had on Joy, PCL brace? They make some different PCL ones that are specifically designed to try and augment and not let it not let it sit posteriorly subluxed. And so I active, try to get active, active knee bending and brace. Yes, you, you have to start bend. You, you have to start your flexion, or you're going to get issues potential with arthrofibrosis. And that sounds in your country like you're really going to run into problems then with simple daily things. And so I think you either do one of those braces. I do think if you've got an active person that that it is appropriate to offer the option of a reconstruction immediately, because I do think now with our techniques, we can get failure rates that are in the five or six or 7% range. And now you have them with a really stable knee, no laxity through the full range of motion. And, and so I don't think that's wrong. I really don't. Some people will argue with me and say, you must do the conservative. I think as long as your patient is fully informed, if they're active, that you could say, if you want me to, I will do this immediately. If you want, we can try a trial of bracing and see, and then if you're unstable, then we can do it. And, and let your patient choose their own health care rather than trying to force them. Correct. And also the degree of dynamic instability might be more, and hence the importance of stress views, uh, which are not really advocated in the acute setting because of pain, swelling, and so on and so forth. So certainly right. it, it, would, it would not undermine the problem. Great. Any other questions from the panel before we conclude? I think Shriyash, it's all done. So if you can conclude. And, okay, great. Thanks, James. Uh, on behalf of the Indian Arthroscopy Society and myself, uh, I, I'm really grateful for your participation uh, and really a very informative talk, uh, sharing us an insight on the up-to-date uh, management and controversies regards uh, the management of PCL injury. So thank you once again. and. Uh, Hopefully, we look forward to meeting in person at some point in the near future. I hope so. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Stay safe. thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, friends, uh, indeed a wonderful presentation. And uh, thanks to uh, Shriyash for organizing this one. Uh, we do have a webinar tomorrow. Our speaker tomorrow is Dr. Ellen Getgood. He's going to talk about meniscus repair for the posterior lesions. Where are we today? Uh, Dr. Allen is from University of West Ontario, uh, Canada, and he's an active uh, sports uh, medicine specialist. Uh, do tune in tomorrow uh, evening, 5 p.m. Uh, on 17th October, Saturday, for this interesting webinar.